This is Adrian Warnock's Christian Podcast. Thank you for joining us. Hi, I'm Adrian Warnock and I'm here with Dr. Kenneth Almer. Thank you for joining us, uh, Dr. Almer. Thank you for having me. It's an honour to be here. Well, we've just come from the 300 conference where you very kindly spoke and we had a, a great time there. Did you enjoy it yourself? It was a great time. Great turnout and a great time of fellowship. And I hope the people who came were blessed. Well, that's certainly the message that I was hearing as I uh, came out, so I really had a good time. So tell me something. I mean, how long have you known Toffee? What, three years, a couple of years, a couple uh-huh. years. Yeah. Okay. We, we met through Dr. Jack Hayford. Okay, and Spent you've, known, three years, you've yeah. known Hayford, Hayford a lot longer than we've known Ah, together. 25. Okay. Almost 30 years. And are you then coming from that more sort of uh, Pentecostal type of background in the church? Or not really, no? not really. Our church would, would be more charismatic. Okay. Charismatic versus Pentecostal. Okay. Uh, significant difference. Yeah. Um, I, I'm familiar with that, but I'm not sure. If okay. Watching okay. Would be Pentecostal so. churches are those whose roots, whose origins are primarily traced back to 1906, mm-hmm. the Azusa revival yeah. in Los Angeles. Charismatic churches are those of us whose roots were non-Pentecostal and primarily traced back to mm-hmm. 1960, early yeah. 60s with uh, Dennis Bennett. And the difference is that these are churches who were non-Pentecostal in their origin, sometimes Baptist, sometimes Lutheran, many of whom have their, their origin in Europe, yes. but who embraced theolo- uh, uh, Pentecostal theology um, somewhere along the way. And yeah. so we are, our church would be charismatic because we were originally, and my journey was originally through the Baptist church. Oh, that's interesting. Yes, I mean, that's very similar to the group of churches that I, I'm a part of as okay. well. So okay. many of ours started as, as Baptist churches, and okay. indeed some of the churches in New Frontiers are still members of the Baptist Union. Okay. Day, which is, yeah. uh, so technically your churches would be charismatic like yes. ours. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So so there you go. That's something yeah. else we've got in common. We just and I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, tell me a bit more then about your own personal journey and all of that, because it is, I think, a bit unusual, isn't it, for someone to come... Uh, not so unusual, but for some people it seems a, a big jump to come from a more traditional Baptist background. I'm, I'm guessing were you born a Baptist? Or? Uh, well, I, 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 I grew up in a Baptist home. Mm-hmm. My parents were both Baptists. Um, and of course we believe that you're, you're baptized into that faith as opposed to um, more Catholic structures where you're born into yeah. it. But yeah, my journey was through the Baptist church. Uh, grew up in Baptist, started playing Sunday school and playing the piano for church mm-hmm. when I was, what, seven, eight, nine years old. Uh, and so my journey was through the Baptist Church and about 1986, mid-80s, was when I began to make a theological shift. And when would you say you got saved? Was that When I was 10. Yeah. And that was in a Baptist Church. Okay. That was in a Baptist Church. And what, what was that like for you? Um, well, obviously life-changing. I mean, I at, at our church, at our church, every first Sunday, every first Sunday, uh, the kids in the Sunday school would be brought into the what we call the parent body. So the kids would come into the into the section where the adults were. And every first Sunday of every month, our pastor would present the gospel to the kids, the children who were in Sunday school. And it was on that Sunday in June. I was ten years old, and uh, that's when I accepted Christ. Uh, okay. And uh, then later on, you said you began to shift theologically. Talk about that. Yeah, that was much later. I, I, I was wrong then, obviously, and had been through. Uh, I don't know. I thought you were younger than you uh, were. So. Trust me, it's just the makeup. Um, <laughs> but you know, I, I think it was several, several, several uh, paths led to this shift for me. Uh, one was just, I think, a hunger for more and more of the Word and a hunger for more of God. And that's kind of a cliche, but but for me, it really was. Um, um, there was a revival in in America called the uh, uh, Pensacola revival. Okay, and yes. one of the songs that came out that was the song that says, There Must Be More. There yes. Must Be More. A guy named uh, Randall uh, Cooley wrote that song. And it was entitled, There Must Be More. So I think for me, that was much of my journey. Just the desire for more of God, to learn more of God. And and from a more academic standpoint, it was just to study, 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 mm-hmm. study the word more. And the more I studied, the more I began to see some inconsistency. I was raised in and trained in and studied in more of a dispensational cessationist uh, um, atmosphere where, where our our tradition, our theology, our doctrine believe that uh, certain parts of scripture, particularly those in, that relate to spiritual gifts, uh, were dispensational. By that we mean they God did some things back then that he does not do any longer. Yeah. 
uh, and which is which typically, is typically typical, yeah. you know. Because uh, the Bible says Jesus is the same as they said forever. Well, yeah, but you know, again, name of name of denomination, Baptist, Lutheran, whatever, yeah. uh, whose theology and whose uh, um, doctrine primarily believes that those things no longer exist today. Um, particularly the nine gifts in First Corinthians twelve, thirteen, yeah. and fourteen, and so uh, mine became more of an academic interest of seeing what I felt, and more and more I felt was an inconsistency between what I had been taught uh, systematically and what I was reading in Scripture, and that alongside of again personal hunger. So for me, it was a personal journey. And were you a pastor by this point already? Or? Uh, not quite. No, no, no. My interest was before I became a pastor, okay. uh, and the first church that I pastored was and we organized was a Baptist church. Okay. It was Macedonia Bible Baptist Church. Okay. And therein, therein became an interesting challenge for me because the name of the church was Macedonia Bible Baptist Church and I began to feel some tension between the Baptist and the Bible. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, which is a terrible way to put it. Uh, but that began the questioning and the interest on my part in addition to the fact that I had a friend who said I was going to die and go to hell because I hadn't spoken in tongues, which oh is a whole other conversation. <laughs> yeah, but just going back for one second, it's interesting, isn't it? Because some people will... Um, put asunder really the Bible and the Holy Spirit and say well you know if we've got the Spirit we don't need the Bible or if we've got the Bible we don't need the Holy Spirit really and I guess what you're saying is you were seeing that contradiction and saying well hang on I, I don't want to become a charismatic because you know of experience but because what I, it sounds to me like you're coming to it from the Bible and say well this doesn't seem to match up with what I'm saying well again I think, I think that, was my, that was my challenge because mm-hmm. I um, my passion and sometimes my, my problem my passion and my problem, I think, be, was intellectual. Yeah. My passion was uh, the, the, the intellectual um, hunger for the word that often conflicted with the lack of consistency that I saw between what I was reading often and what I had been taught. And when you've been an academician, when you've been trained as a scholar, trained as a student, etc., you know, you know, you're, you're taught along a certain, a certain uh, intellectual structure a certain theological structure, then that's what's poured into you based on where you go, what school you go to, what church, etc. And then when you begin to see some inconsistencies, you have to ask yourself, now what about that? And how do I track that down? So for me, it was a personal hunger, a per- almost a personal obsession. Right. Obsession of, but what does the word say? But what does the word say? But what does the word say? And then to realize that there are millions, and that's not an exaggeration, maybe billions of people who are in theological structures who disagree with this. You know, and, and who uh, even today disagree with that. But to stand at, as best I could to say, but here's what the word says. Mm-hmm. But here's what the word says. And you came to the conclusion that that's what the word says before you had that experience? Is that yes. Right? Oh, yes, certainly. Certainly, certainly. I mean, uh, for example, the, the, the gift of speaking in tongues and other languages uh, was first for me an intellectual pursuit. It was, uh, well, where does it say this? Is over. Where does mm. it say this ends? And and the, and some of the texts that were used, uh, I, I took issue with. I took issue with the things, and that was I was taught uh, these gifts ended because this has happened or this is this. And I'm saying, but where does it say that? You know, mm. and, I, I, and I, I really wrestled with that. So it began first of all intellectual, experientially. That was the gap from saying yes, I believe this, Lord. Now give it to me. And your Lord, friend at that point started saying, "Hey, you're not saved." So you're well, what, yeah, oh, yeah, that was, oh, there certainly was a friend of mine who said, "You're more than not saved. You're dying, going to hell." Right. <laughs> uh, which, of course, was another extreme. Yeah. And and so there again was a challenge intellectually because I had to recognize that there were there was this continuum, and as as Chuck Swindoll says, Chuck Swindoll says, God is seldom at the extremes where we are; He's usually somewhere in the middle. Well, and yeah. so there were the pendulum was swinging in the exact opposite direction, and you were all dying and going to hell on the one hand versus there's no such thing as those as those gifts nowadays and so I tried my, my best to try to reconcile that once recognizing that scripturally um, I could not defend I could not defend um, the cessationist position although it was all around me mm. literally all around me uh, denominationally relationally I mean I, I lost lost friends when I made the shift theologically to be more charismatic and more embracing of of those gifts in particular and the charismatic theology in particular. Uh, so I, I, it cost me something. But um, once I realized that, that, that I believe that the word says this, then I began a personal desire for the experience. A friend of mine, who became a friend of mine, named Larry Lee, 
Larry Lee started a movement in LA, uh, in America actually, it was a prayer movement called The Prayer Breakthrough. Prayer Breakthrough, and Larry Lee would travel all around the states. He wrote a book called Could You Not Tarry One Hour? Could You Not Tarry One Hour? And it was basically a book on prayer. That coupled with a book by Jack Hayford called Invading the Impossible um, that talked about prayer. And then finally Jack Hayford wrote a book called uh, The Beauty of Spiritual Language. So these three books met my intellectual mm. and my academic hunger. But then again, it's, it's, the, it's the experience. And so this, this um, crusade, they were called crusades, breakthroughs, were, were traveling all around America. And uh, they came to Los Angeles in the uh, Anaheim Convention Center. Prayer breakthrough, Larry Lee and others, prayer breakthrough. breakthrough. And, and I went that night all by myself. Went on alone, didn't take anybody, didn't tell anybody. And I must have sat up in the 25th row in the 65th seat or somewhere and no one knew me and I didn't know anyone. And uh, just the power of God just fell in that place, man. Twenty some thousand people, and and there's a spirit of worship, and a spirit of praise, and in that time of, of just uh, uh, anxiously and innocently crying out to the Lord, and that's when the Lord baptized me. And that's when I began to speak. And and it was it was almost carnal because I said, "Who said that? Where did that come from?" You know. Uh, but it was just I think my spirit crying out to the Lord, and. Um, as, as the Bible said, your, as your spirit overflows and, and words begin to come out, that that you know, that you know the spirit has given utterance. So what was that like sort of emotionally? How were you feeling at that moment? Oh, it wiped me out. I mean, it, 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 was, it, was, like, it was like, wow, turning on a faucet. And uh, it, it literally, it literally, I, I felt as though this, this whatever had been pent up in me was just being released. And it, I literally was drained. That is not an exaggeration. It just drained. But, but it was in such a spirit of worship and praise. And again, 20-some thousand people around me. 20-some people, 20 thousand people around me. Uh, and so it wasn't like I, I felt self-conscious, you know. And, and everyone was praying or praising or singing or whatever. So I didn't feel self-conscious at all. But uh, it was almost like a zone. And it was just me and God. And uh, I just poured out my heart. And uh, in 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 utterances that I believe the Spirit had given me. Okay, and so from then, you know, things were very different. Were they? Yeah, because because from then, now it is. Well, what do you do with this? Well, you're leading people and you're shepherding people, etc. And that what that's what began after that personal experience. That would be that's what began the shift theologically, corporately, in our church, uh, which took mm, several years actually several years. Uh, the, the pivotal point came when there was the creation of an organization called uh, Full Gospel Baptist Church Fellowship, which was organizationally a group of Baptist churches that came together who embraced the things of the Spirit. And so by definition, we were charismatic Baptists. Okay. Uh, and that group is, it is through that group that I became consecrated as bishop. As a matter of fact, I was one of the founding bishops on the Bishop's Council, and my assignment was Bishop of Christian Education. So my assignment was to write the theology, to document the theology of this group, this new group. Uh, and as I said earlier, I mean, many of us, oh gosh, lost friends. I know guys that got put out of their churches. Um, uh, relationships were broken uh, because the word was Baptists don't do that. You know, and so it was really, really traumatic for many of us. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, so from that shift, and then um, uh, me then carrying the title of, of bishop in that organization and me having the assignment of codifying and documenting the theology of that group that still not exists. Matter of fact, it's coming, on, coming up on 20 years now. Okay. Uh, but to be a part of that group made the shift for our local congregation much easier. Okay. And we um, and, and ended up shifting theologically. And we, we changed the name of the church. It wasn't Faithful Central, Faithful Central Missionary Baptist Church. Uh, and we became, as we are now, Faithful Central Bible Church. So it was Very a journey, good. but Very good, yeah. a great journey. So, I mean, already listening to you, um, I'm, I'm seeing the, the reason for the rumor, that, or the nickname, let's say, that they, they give you the professor in the pulpit. You've obviously got an academic bent, um, but also that very much. Call me? That's what some people call me, yeah. <laughs> um, but also the charismatic. It doesn't always go together. So, talk to me a bit right. more about that. Yeah, I, I think. Um, I think, you know, and that raises another issue because I, I think one of the challenges that the church faces today 
is uh, intellectualism, mm. and humanism. Mm. I think that there is often seen to be an inconsistency between an, ins an informed head and an inspired heart. That those who feel like if, if, you're, if you are spiritually inspired, then you give up something intellectually. That those who feel that if you, if you take the intellectual route, um, um, then you can't dabble in those kinds of emotional things and those kinds of uh, 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 inspirational things on that level. Um, but I think ultimately it is the synthesis of an informed head and an inspired heart um, that, that creates um, a witness and a testimony that um, broadens your appeal. I think one of the challenges that we find today is that um, the church faces a challenge with, with um, the rising intellectualism and humanism and secularism that is probably uh, the greatest challenge in the modern day church today. I mean, the shift in our culture, and not only here in, in, in America, but here in Europe and all, and maybe we're following you guys, I don't know, but uh, the shift uh, to secularism and humanism and intellectualism um, is the challenge I believe that the church is facing. Materialism and all that mixed in the pot. It's a big stew. Mm -hmm. It's a stew. And yet God has called us, meaning the church, for such a time as this. Now what is so very interesting is it's not much, much different than the context of the first church yeah. in scripture. <laughs> you know, the, 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 the tenets of culture that are antithetical to the beliefs and principles of the kingdom. I mean, that's what kingdom is all about. Kingdom of darkness, kingdom of light, gates of hell, etc. You know, that's what I think and God is calling the church back to a reliance upon the same kind of power that identified and that uh, uh, caused the church back in those days to, as scripture said, turn the world upside down, that we must return to that kind of power. Mm. Uh, as antiquated as that may seem to some intellectuals, and yet that's what we're then, and as you said, God saying it the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Yeah. I believe you can do it again. Yeah, and I think it's interesting, isn't it? Because there's two things happening in our culture. In the one hand, they're becoming more intellectual, but on the other hand, I think there is a hunger for the authentic, for the real, and there's an increase in things like spiritualism and all those kind of stuff. So, you know, I think this is probably uh, one of, if not the most spiritual cultures but ungodly cultures mm. in history this is a very spiritual culture but a very ungodly culture in other words uh, we must never never confuse spirituality with godliness never never uh, spirituality does not necessarily in any way have anything to do with godliness I think we have a culture as you said that are hunger for spiritual things I think that opens the door for the church I think that creates uh, a culture that is receptive, in a sense, to, what the, to the message of the church. But on the other hand, this spirituality goes all over the place. For example, there's no longer the debate of, is there God and is God dead? No, that's not the debate anymore. This is not a culture that denies the reality of God. It's the exact opposite. It's a culture that accepts all kinds of gods. It's just a plurality of gods. Uh, I've got your God, you've got, I got a God, you got a God, all God's children got a job, got a God. You know, it's that kind of thing. But I think it opens the door for the church to be a witness, if it will. Mm. Our challenge is to what degree will the church be the church? To what degree will the church be swallowed up in this, in this uh, nebulous kind of spirituality? I, mean, I, I think the, the challenge that the church faces faces is a tension. A tension between being attractive and being authentic. Mm. Jesus says, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men. If I be lifted up, I, Jesus the Christ, uh, uh, and, and he is the savior of the world, if I, that's authentic. I will draw, I will attract men unto me. That's attractiveness. I think the tension is that the church should live in that crossroads between being authentic and being attractive, not either or. But I think the church often opts for one or the other. Mm. We choose to be attractive, and in doing so, we will sacrifice our authenticity. Or we choose to be so authentic that we have no appeal to the culture in the world at all, and so we've lost our attractiveness. The challenge is not either or, but both. How do I preach the authentic message of Christ, the authentic message of the gospel, and yet in such a way 
that I'm attractive to this world or rather that I lift up a Christ who is attractive. Uh, and that's the challenge that we face because uh, it's much easier to pick one or the other. Mm. Uh, Jesus says, if I draw, if, if, if I'm lifted, I will draw. I'll do both. Mm. Mm. The church, I think, finds it easier to be, to, 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 for example, to be so attractive that we, um, how can I say it, that we uh, dilute our message. Mm. That we, um, uh, we, we, we compromise, if you will, the, um, the Christ who is the way, the truth, the life. You have to do something with that verse. I mean, you can do like, there's a guy named Marcion in scripture, but came to a passage that he didn't, in history rather, came to a verse he didn't like, he just ripped that page out. Just carried it. His, his Bible was like a pamphlet. More of a brochure, you know. But, but you have to do something with I'm the way, the truth, the life. Well, if that's the Christ that we represent, that's the Christ we must present. On the other hand, we must do it in such a way that we attract this hunger, and it is a hunger, you were right, this hunger for spirituality that's in the world. Uh, and so technology becomes a tool. Uh, uh, it becomes merely a way of reaching this this contemporary culture. We, we maintain our message, we adjust our methods. We maintain our message, we adjust our methods. Uh, when, when, when Paul went to um, Ephesus and, and Thessalonica, uh, his message, and, and, and Rome even, and Greece, his message had to be shifted, or his methods were shifted from the way it was done by Peter and the guys back in Jerusalem, because that was a totally Jewish culture. But when they got out, I mean, look, look at uh, 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 Mars Hill, this debate. The great, the great criticism about Paul on that day is uh, he never talked about Jesus. He never presented Christ. And yet, uh, a few were saved. Maybe the church has to start with sticking with the message and not attempting to be so attractive that we try to reach all by diluting our message. And sometimes that's the easier way to go. Hmm. It's interesting how we do have that kind of choice, you know, it's like charismatic or Bible focus, it's like uh, missional or let's get really spiritual and pursue the gifts. How do you hold those things together as a pastor? How, how do you make sure your church is all the things that you're describing and more? Uh, very tenderly. Uh, <laughs> and, sometimes, and sometimes not always successfully. Hmm. It's a challenge. It's a challenge. Uh, how do you do it? I think you, first of all, you continue to remind yourself that you must do it. Mm. You continue to remind yourself that you, it's not, again, it's not an either or. But that's tough sometimes now. That's tough sometimes. I mean, uh, sometimes uh, the, the, the church culture leans so, so far to the attractive side that, again, uh, the, the models of success... The, the examples of success, that's the way you do church nowadays, um, sometimes, sometimes uh, is heavier on attractiveness than it is on authenticity. Yeah. And so this message of Christ has often been diluted and watered down in the, in the, in the interest of gathering a bigger crowd. Mm. And that's not to say that crowds are bad. I mean, obviously Jesus fed thousands. But, but on the other hand, again, there's this tension. And that's tough sometimes. Mm. But it's not optional. It's tough, but it's not optional. Okay. So if people are looking for more information, I know you've written books and things. And what, what, which of your books would help a bit more on some of the stuff we're talking about? Hmm. What do you need to write a new? I was going to say I dare not say that I'm a place to come as a source. I, you know, I tell you, what, I just, I just wrote a book called Passionate God, yeah. uh, which is, which is. Uh, an examination of the passions of God, the, a God who feels, a God who, who, who we can relate to and who relates to us because he's a God of feeling, he's a God of passion. Um, he's a God who loves us with an everlasting love, the passion of love, a love that is so great that he gave his only son. He loves. But because he loves, he's, uh, he's jealous. And because he's jealous, he's grieved when we reject his love. And so I walked through these various emotions of God that obviously are likened to the emotions that we feel, that we have as we are created in His image, but in an effort to try to help us understand the God that we serve and the God who loves us. But it's a challenge sometimes. And I suppose that's the thing, isn't it? If we get God in the right place, a lot of the other stuff follows, would you say? 
Well, yes, yes, but it's getting done in the right place that becomes a challenge. Yeah. You know, I, I think, I think that uh, um, doing that pragmatically, doing that on a day-to-day -day basis, I think that's the challenge. That's the truth, but it's the challenge. And yet, it comes down to that. But, but I, I would not, by any means, imply that that's just you know, you know, a song and a prayer. That's a day-to-day -day walk, man. It's a it's a day-to-day -day journey, it, and and sometimes you slip, and sometimes you stumble, and you get right back up, and you start all over again. Uh, my friend um, um, Donnie 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 McClurkin wrote a song that says, "We fall down, but we get back up. Mm. We fall down, but we get up again." And I think that's the thing. You don't stop. You continue to press on because again, it's it's tough, but it's not an option. Okay. Well, that's great. I mean. I wonder if that might be a good place for us to leave it. Is there anything else you'd like to just say in, in closing? No, thank you for having me. Yeah, I appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Come. Well, you've made it to the end of an episode of Adrian Warnock's Christian Podcast. You must have some stamina. Well done. And if you liked what you heard, you know what to do. Subscribe, review, Tell all your friends about it. And in the meantime, why not visit adrianwarnock.com?